Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you for all you do in our lives, for who you are, that we've been blessed in Christ so abundantly. I just ask as we go forward in our study here and we feast together upon your word, that you would filter out all that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're back in our study in Revelation. We've been looking at uh, chapters 17 and 18, which uh, tend to go together. And we're going to be moving into chapter 19. Uh, so I've got a lot of ground to cover. And I just want to say I appreciate all of your comments, your emails, your questions. And if we disagree on anything, that's a good thing. It is, uh, it's always been my belief that no man has a handle on the truth. Now, I believe that there's going to be a literal city. Uh, when we're looking at the, the mystery Babylon, uh, the great, the woman, the harlot, I believe that there's every bit of evidence to support the idea that this represents all false forms of religion or worship. It has in the past, and it does in the present, and it will in the future. And prophecy is, this, these prophecies are future, that's my position. Uh, I haven't asked anybody to agree with me on that, that these aren't fulfilled prophecies. I think, I, I think that as we've gone through this, we've seen enough evidence to support the fact that these are not prophecies that have been fulfilled, but they're yet future. Uh, I believe there's going to be a literal city. Uh, the woman, the harlot, represents uh, a city. And of course, uh, uh, the city then, uh, if we don't, if we stop right there, we're taking the literal approach. If we say that, well, that then the city represents something else. Now we have a double, we have double symbolism, which, uh, and if that's the case, then well, it's the first time in all of Scripture that that occurs. Uh, that is, you know, the woman represents a city, the city represents something else. And that's going to fall in one hour. The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast shall hate the harlot, make her desolate, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Uh, Revelation 18, 8. Horns. Uh, I encourage you all to take and do a little research and look into how the, uh, the relationship that horns have with the second largest religion on the planet. Uh, there is no relationship, at least that I've seen, where that these, uh, the, the, the papal system, the Vatican, the Pope, the Roman Catholic system has any relationship to horns, at least not as Islam does. And so she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her. The ten horns, and not talked a little bit about that, the ten horns, they give their authority to the beast for that period of time to destroy uh, this mystery Babylon. The ten horns turn against the, the, uh, the woman. And I expressed my idea as to what I believe that that was referring to. Uh, if you're just now jumping into this study, uh, where I'm at the end of chapter 18 going into 19, I encourage you to, to go back and watch the past several videos. Now, I want to point out a fact, a couple of facts, in, in fact, uh, here, th things that I just want you to think about. This is a great city, and the merchants mourn her loss when they see her burning. She's a great exporter of fine goods, merchandise. Uh, she's not a, a buyer, but she's a seller. The text makes it clear that she's not the one buying, she's the one selling. Now, I did a little research. Italy, uh, if you want to say that this great Babylon is Rome, Italy is the 24th richest country, whereas the United Arab Emirates is the 14th richest 
country on the planet. And I remind you that prophecy is Middle Eastern centric. Okay, it's not European centric. It's not uh, North American centric. Neither Jerusalem or Iraq. Uh, if you want to look at Baghdad, uh, ancient uh, Babylon that, that lies near uh, the modern day city of Baghdad. Uh, neither one of those, neither Jerusalem or Iraq, appear in the top 24. Uh, ancient Babylon. Let's, let's think for a moment. Rebuilt, the rapture occurs. Ancient Babylon is rebuilt in three to seven years. I'd say more like three to six years. Where it exceeds the U.S. in wealth, which just happens to be the wealthiest nation on earth, even though it's got the greatest uh, uh, income gap of any nation in, on the planet. Prophecy, folks, is Middle Eastern centric. And the United Arab Emirates has emerged as the wealthiest country in the Middle East. Do a simple Google search. And ask Google, what's the wealthiest country in the Middle East? It'll tell you it's the United Arab Emirates. Mystery Babylon, in my opinion, and we can disagree on this and still be friends, is not the USA. According to prophecy, all the nations that Christ fights when he returns are Muslim. All of them. He's seen coming out of Elam, that's southern Jordan, and Edom, and that would be uh, southern Iran, what is now southern Iran, with his garment stained in the blood of Islam. That's Isaiah 63, 1. Our Lord is not seen coming out of Arkansas with a hillbilly blood-stained garment. Okay? So that's my position on this. I think I've made it clear that at least my position for what it's worth, and I could be wrong, and you don't have to agree, that Islam plays a significant role in all this because it is the second largest religion on the planet. And when Christianity, the rap, when the rapture of the church occurs, it's going to be prominent, dominant. It's going to play a dominant role. To, to even suggest the idea that, that it will play no significant role, given its size, given the factoring in the, the geography, uh, the biblical evidence, uh, the ancient history of uh, the Arabs, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the, the, the conflict between the two seeds, it's, it's almost impossible for me to take any other position. Now, we've come a long way. We've, we have four chapters left in this book and three uh, of, well, we've got four chapters ahead of us and these, these four move very rapidly. Uh, that's not me going through them rapidly. That's the chapters themselves, the, the, the text that concludes very rapidly. And I am persuaded that these are prophetic chapters. We have the end of the 70 weeks of Daniel that are promised in Daniel chapter 9. The end of the Jewish period. God's dealings with Israel. The establishment of the earthly kingdom that's been prophesied and talked about over and over and over again in the Old Testament. Uh, the imprisonment of Satan where he's bound uh, for a thousand years. The glories of the kingdom. That, and then where he's loosed then after that thousand years, and then this last desperate attempt of Satan to overthrow uh, Christ uh, after there's been a thousand years of peace. Uh, and then the, followed by the great white throne judgment, and then the et eternal state where that uh, eternity begins. And we have that all in four chapters.
And uh, as I've mentioned, the the variation of opinion on all of these chapters, all of them, from Revelation 1 to Revelation 22, is almost astronomical. I mean, you've got your work cut out for you if you sift through all the opinions, the commentaries, the different viewpoints. So I don't ask anyone to agree with me on anything, but to search the scriptures as you would in any other study, and then just draw your own conclusions based on the evidence that, that you see about these things to come. And though I might sound dogmatic, and I know I do at times, about you know certain uh, verses, passages of Scripture, uh, you need to study. We all need to study to show ourselves approved. So as a note of reference, I find it impossible to go through these passages and not see doctrine applicable to us. It's the temptation, and, it's, and it's, it's very real, is to go through this with your mind focused on nothing but things to come. Folks, there's doctrine, vital doctrine that I, I don't think that we ought to miss as we go through these chapters, even though this is prophetic. Basically, the, this, this entire book is prophetic. We've seen doctrine. I've pointed it out since Revelation chapter 1. Uh, so there's doctrine that's applicable to the church today, though we're not going to be in step one foot inside Daniel's 70th week. This is a time in which God is deal, wrapping up his dealings with his nation, Israel. He's finished. The church age is concluded. The church has no place inside Daniel's 70th week. Uh, so that's as far as my opinion on all this goes, which may not be worth very much. I think I've spelled out my position clearly on chapters 18 and 19. Folks, my position here is that the Antichrist, I believe, he'll rise to power, claiming to be the Islamic Messiah. Christianity's counterfeit. He'll rise to power through that system, but then once he has power, he destroys that system. He doesn't destroy or judge the nations of Islam, but he destroys that system. God uses the Antichrist to accomplish that purpose. And rising to power through that system to then only destroy that system, which guarantees his power or makes him think that he gives him some false assurance that he's, he's now in control. Therefore, he then has a reason to move his capital to Jerusalem it's not where I believe he starts out, but that's he has a reason to move his capital there because his goal is to, is to take Jerusalem from Israel and declare himself to be God. Now, the kingdoms of earth are made rich by this evil world system. Mystery Babylon the Great. And the, the words after these things in, in chapter 18, verse 1, show that after the woman is destroyed, the city now suffers the same fate. So we're looking at two separate things here. Therefore, the woman can't be the literal city mystery Babylon. I believe that the that's where the ten horns come in. I believe that the headquarters in the Antichrist has to be a literal city until it's destroyed and he moves that headquarters to Jerusalem. Uh, based on a age-old conflict between the descendants of Abraham's two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Now, you don't have to agree with that, but that's that's what the Old Testament is is telling me. Uh, but it, but it has all the support of both testaments, the Old and New Testaments, both. Uh, how much she has glorified herself, herself. And they cast dust on their heads, these 
Uh, it's amazing. Uh, stop and think about that. They cast dust on their heads. I've spent a lot of time talking about giving you at least my opinion that I think this is Middle Eastern centric. I, I don't know. I've never met a, an American that, that in, in a time of mourning, would, uh, whether it was a death of a loved one, a funeral, uh, some catastrophe that occurred in their life. I never, I never saw anyone cast dust on their head. Uh, now, I don't know. I guess I suppose maybe perhaps you might find out that Italians do that. But just that one phrase, to me, supports the idea that these prophecies are Middle Eastern centric. Just that one statement. Uh, since the whore Babylon will at one time have control over these kings, the statement who have received no kingdom as of yet must be referring to their desire to establish a global Islamic state or empire, which is actually what you've seen, you and I've seen right here at the present time in our own, for the past several years, the idea of a revived uh, Ottoman empire. Uh, we've seen that. We've witnessed that personally, up close and personal, especially on uh, after 9-11 or on 9-11 and thereafter. Uh, so at some point, these kings will turn on her and destroy her. That's Revelation chapter 17. And most likely they do that when the, the Antichrist claims to be God. I want you to understand that Islam must take great offense at the Antichrist setting himself up as God. Because they believe that there is no God but Allah. And the Antichrist cannot, will not, in my opinion, have any tolerance at all for any opposition. It just makes sense. It seems logical to me. Uh, the Antichrist enters, he entered into the picture as a man of peace to all men, but especially to Islam. He played Islam. Jesus said to his people, Israel, he said, if another comes in my name, him you'll receive. Him you will receive. The text tells us that this Babylon is destroyed, that it goes into eternal ruin in one day. Well, you can rule out Jerusalem because it's not going to go into eternal ruin in one day. The... Uh, the holy city, Jerusalem, will never be destroyed in that way. Now, ancient Babylon already lies in ruins, okay? Uh, it's not ruins in the sense that if you, and when I was in the Navy and I traveled around the Med uh, and, and was given liberty and I visited some of these early synagogues that lied in ruins or that it was just weeds growing up around, it's not like that. It's not, that's not the ruins that we're talking about but we're talking about a lot of it has been preserved even though Saddam Hussein actually built over the top of some of these ancient uh, ruins uh, which didn't make uh, a lot of the Iraqis very happy uh, if this city is literal which I believe it is its location must be somewhere. And its destruction must be what causes the Antichrist to relocate to his headquarters, if you want to call it that. I believe to Israel's capital, Jerusalem, where that he then claims to be God. That infuriates Islam, which he deceived. Uh, and unbelieving Israel there will be believing Jews and non-believing Jews both. Unbelieving Israel accepts him as her long-awaited uh, uh, Messiah. If another come in my name, him you will receive. Um, you can't look at Israel as just well, just lump them into one group of of people. You know, Israel. 
There's going to be believers and non-believers. We see that in the parable of the uh, ten virgins as well, which I, I'm gonna, I hope to touch on a little more uh, at some point. Uh, they enter into a covenant of death and hell with him, is what Isaiah chapter 28 says. We know the whore of Babylon has religious connotations. It's not just a political system, but it's a religious system. With the beast being the focus of an end times religious system. One that revived from having received a deadly head wound. It's not some man or the Antichrist who was assassinated like JFK and then miraculously came back to life. So now what that's talking about. It's a system, a religious system, that was suff suffered a deadly head wound. That is the Ottoman Empire. There's the fall of the Ottoman Empire by, by Britain uh, in 1923 after the First World War. That's when it suffered that deadly head wound. And according to Islam, the Mahdi, that's, that's the, the biblical Antichrist, will return, uh, showing the Jewish Jesus to be the Antichrist. It's a re complete reversal, folks. Now, this is an important factor in all this. When the biblical Antichrist who deceived Islam sits in a Jewish temple claiming to be God, Islam will consider this blasphemy. What is the most unforgivable sin in Islam? It's actually got a name, Sirk or Shirk, however you want to pronounce it. It is the sin of idolatry uh, or polytheism. That is the uh, deification or the worship of anyone or anything besides Allah. Islam teaches that God does not share his divine attributes with any partner. So how do you think they're going to react to the Antichrist claiming himself to be God? I've pointed out in a number of past videos, uh, uh, you might find them in the playlist of, of prophecy videos, how that scripture reveals that the Antichrist will come out of Turkey after the Lord takes us, removes us from the scene. Uh, that Antichrist will desire, he'll desire, just as Turkey desires today, to have full control over this revived Ottoman Empire, the deadly wound that was healed. So, taken literally, he establishes his headquarters in Mystery Babylon, not a rebuilt city of ancient Babylon, uh, not where the uh, Tower of ba It doesn't have to be ancient Babylon. It doesn't have to be where the Tower of Babel stood. It doesn't have to be where the Jews were exiled. People are. This is mystery Babylon, and and people I under, understand, folks. People are divided as to who this harlot is. You know, you've got a lot of choices. You know, you can say it's the revived Roman Empire, the the papal system. Uh. You can say it's the city of Jerusalem, or that it's the United States of America, or that it's the apostate church, or that it represents, it really isn't a city at all. It just represents the love of the world as opposed to the love of God. Well, in a very real sense, it does, but it has a specific identity. You know, there's the Catholic view, that you've got that the Reformed view, that's heavily uh, 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 in favor, the reform view, heavily in favor of, of it being the papal system, for obvious reasons. You got the Seventh Day Adventist view, you got the Jehovah Witness view, you got the Latter day Saints view, you got a lot of views to choose from. But both prophecy as well as history and current days or last day's events, in my opinion, plainly reveal Islam plays a significant role in all of this. Just stop and ask yourself, what plans do you think Satan has for Islam in these final days of Daniel's 70th week? Would you say nothing? You know, if you say, well, not much, 
then what you're suggesting is that this this master deceiver, this father of all lies, will not use the world's largest religion at that time to further his scheme of deception. I believe we're looking at the rapture, leaving all apostate religious systems, that is the harlot, that's all that will be left. Then the ten horns, that's... Uh, basically uh, has to do with Islam, uh, destroy her. All of those other, it's a whittling down, folks. They uh, destroy her, then the Antichrist destroys Islam. No competition. The Anti Antichrist plays Islam to gain control, where he then turns against Islam to be one God, that one God that the world will worship or die. And then Christ returns, destroys the Antichrist and the false prophet. So, so we're taken out of the way. Then all other forms of religion by Islam, they, they, they remove those out of, out of the, get those out of the way. And then Islam has to go. It has to go to make way for the worship of the Antichrist. That's my position. And then finally, Christ defeats the Antichrist and the false prophet. The Antichrist folks will play Islam like a fiddle. Okay? The devil uses Islam to do his dirty work. He uses Islam to destroy all other religious faiths. Then de declares himself to be God through the Antichrist. Which is what he's aspired to do all along, which is unacceptable to Islam and its one God system, Allah. So where he defeats militant Islam, where the, then, then the whole world worships the beast, or doesn't worship the beast and, and pays the consequences for it, suffers the consequences of it. I went through and looked at a lot of this geography and maps and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I mean, who honestly believes that this desolate place that lies in ruins will in just a few short years be rebuilt to fit the description given us of that great city which these merchants cry and mourn over the loss of? Every shipmaster, all the company of ships, sailors, uh, they, they, they stand afar off. They cry when they see the smoke of her burning. Uh, cast dust on their heads. Weeping and wailing. Uh, wherein we're made rich. Okay? That's, there's wealth associated with this city. You know, if you look at, you know, out of the five major seaports, in the Middle East, all five, all five are in Muslim countries. Four of the five are in Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, one's in Egypt. The world's largest is in United Arab Emirates, and there is no seaport in or near ancient Babylon, or in Iraq for that matter. And besides there being no biblical evidence for Rome meeting the criteria for this future Babylon. Uh, you know, Rome is not a seaport. The closest major port to Rome is the port of uh, is uh, Savitia Vecchia. You know, if I, if I could talk like an Italian, which I can't. Besides, Italians don't have a custom of casting dust on their heads. I, at least I don't think they do. At least not like Middle Easterners do. The text clearly says that this city is a seller of luxurious items. And notice that it's not wheat, corn, all those necessities, which, which is what uh, these false forms, religious uh, uh, forms of worship, false religion, false forms of worship, all of them, okay, are focused on material wealth uh, for the most part. It's just, it's a characteristic of them all. That's, that's uh, it's not that they're mourning over the loss of, well, you know, the wheat and, and the, the celery and the, the tomatoes, God forbid, and, you know, all this other stuff. 
The text clearly says that this city is a seller of fine merchandise. Uh, and and Italy is nowhere near the major exporter of uh, this of fine merchandise that Saudi Arabia is. And um, as far as America goes, it is not a wealth. It's a wealthy country. It's the wealthiest on the planet, but it is not a major exporter of luxurious goods. It's not made in the USA anymore. It's not, you know, we're not a major exporter. We're a major importer. It's not now. I doubt it'll ever be. The USA is an importer of cheap foreign merchandise. I just thought I'd throw this in here just as a side note. Now you can do what you want with, with this, but it's been confirmed over and over. 666.6 nautical miles, that's as the crow flies, from the Temple Mount to Islam's holiest site, the, the Kaaba. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Now, chapter 19. If we uh, move over into that, we see, and after these things, that is the destruction of the woman, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. That's a great multitude saying, Alleluia. Uh, in the Greek, you've got, that's a rough breathing, Hallelujah. That's why we get, or we get Hallelujah. But Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Can I say that again? I mentioned how doctrine plays into this heavily, and we tend to miss this. Glory, honor, power unto the Lord our God. I, this is where I want to launch off into a sermon and talk about how that that's... Uh, Typically not the case in modern Christianity today. It's what it is, is we get together and we sing Amazing Grace, and then we sit for 45 minutes to an hour listening to a sermon on law. On what you got to do to make yourself acceptable toward, you know, before God. Or, or, or what you've got to do in, in order to ensure or guarantee your, your ticket, you know, through the pearly gates. But, but this is all preceded by our the hymn Amazing Grace. Uh, so who are these? Who are these people? This much people in heaven. The, the, in the Greek, it's great multitude. Who are these people? Well, we know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, stop and think about that for a moment. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord only refers to the church. And without getting into the time versus eternity thing, which I've also done videos and many of you understand that my position on that is quite, uh, what word should I use? Unorthodox. Let's, let me just leave it at this. It's a great multitude, okay? A great multitude. Now, personally, I think it's everyone. You know, I, everyone that's redeemed, all redeemed, all the redeemed of all ages, you know, here. Oh, it's Steve, but what about time? The time factor. What about, you know, that's just, that's just it, is we're not looking at something that's... Uh, time-centric, but uh, we're looking at something that's other-dimensional, all right? So I'll leave that for the moment. I'll leave it at that. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. You know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and oh, God's going to pay them back for what they've done to us, and I can't wait, and that's not what it's talking about. I've pointed this out before, too. The word is justice, not payback. And so if, 
that God wants, I believe, wants to make it clear to us that it is not our place to feel like this is some righteous, <coughs> we're justified in our righteous indignation and we just can't wait for our enemies to be punished and, and so on and so forth. That is not, in my opinion, that is not the language of the text, the feeling, the emotion, the language of the text. It has to do with justice, not payback. It's just. And I, I spent some time talking about that as well. True worship, praise, uh, you know, we see the justice of God. And so again, they say, hallelujah. Literally, uh, it's, it means praise Yahweh. And so we're looking at doctrine. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. Well, you know, if you're one of those Christians out there or people that doesn't believe that eternity really means eternity or that the lake of fire is a literal place or that forever really means forever, it doesn't really mean forever. The text contradicts those thoughts. God's condemnation is eternal. And it's in that statement, we have to think about the, the price that Christ paid when he died in our place. He died, he suffered the penalty of that condemnation, and that condemnation in our place was equivalent to that condemnation, which is eternal. In the 4 and 20... Elders, which I believe are the church, and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a unmentioned voice came out of, the, the word in the Greek is apo, it's, it's not ek, out of, it's apo, it's away from the throne. So it doesn't tell us who this is. You can say, that's Christ, I love you for it. If, if you say, oh, it's not Christ, I love you just the same saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Verse 7, Then let us be glad and rejoice and give glory to him. There, there we see that again. Give glory to him, not to self, but to him. For the marriage of God has come. No. For the marriage of Jehovah has come. No. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. The Lamb. And I could stop and spend an hour on, on that. And his wife has made herself ready. Well, Steve, we see we got to get ready. Well, how did we make ourselves ready? By the finished through the finished work of Christ. Now, whether you take that 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 as the marriage of the Lamb, that's one thing, and his wife has made herself ready. That's Israel, and that's so that's another thing. Whether you, whether you if that's how you want to look at that, I don't have a problem with that either. I'm not going to tell you which is which. Uh I believe that we are the bride of Christ. I believe that Israel is is the wife of uh, God Jehovah. But it's it is astounding what's been written on that verse. So I'd like to point out a couple of things. Number one, we're told to be glad and rejoice and give glory to Him for the coming of this marriage. So there's something wonderful about it. Be glad, rejoice, give glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Isn't it inter interesting that it isn't the marriage of Christ? It isn't the marriage of Jeho Jehovah, but the marriage of the Lamb. Folks, dearly beloved, if, 
If Christ had not willed to become the Lamb, the Lamb of God, there would be no marriage. There wouldn't be any redemption. There, w there would be no deliverance from sin had he not deigned to leave heaven's glory and become our kinsman redeemer. This book, not the book of Revelation, this book, the, the, the Bible, is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We'll soon have a heavenly messenger reprimand John for not realizing that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The giving forth of this word, the proclaiming of the word of God is Jesus Christ. This isn't a rule book on how you live your life, folks. Okay, I pointed this out numerous times. It is a primarily a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's a revealing of Jesus Christ. If, if you spend your whole life in the, in the Bible, in this book, you can miss seeing it reveal Christ. I, I know I can't explain that very well. Uh, if you just simply look at it as a, a rule book on how to live the Christian life, you, you've missed seeing Christ revealed. This is the marriage of the Lamb because all of God's program is based on the work of Christ in the cross. The Old Testament looks forward to the cross. The New Testament looks back to the cross. Without a cross, there's no marriage. There's no union with God. There's no blessed hope. And... and Dearly beloved, I doubt that any one of us has ever had a real deep comprehension of what Christ endured that we might live. Oh, we know we suffered on the cross, but, you know, others went to the cross. You know, in fact, others were crucified with him when he was crucified, but none ever bore sin that wasn't theirs. And so all of our hope, that blessed hope, is in, is in the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our blessed hope is not just referring to the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is also our blessed hope, but it's primarily what Christ has done in and for us, which words, I don't think in, there's any human language besides the, the, the language God used to give us this revelation can add a adequately, I have a problem with that word, adequately describe just what all that means. Blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. And in my opinion, folks, we could talk about that for months months and it saddens me it I, there's a i carry a deep sadness over the fact that so many of my brothers and sisters for whom he died know so little about what christ has done for them it's really sobering if you stop to realize that a great majority of those who are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ today, but they don't believe that he's God, a very God. They don't believe that he physically rose from the dead or that he was a born of a virgin. And folks, if these things are not true, you are not redeemed and you have no hope. All that God purposed and planned. In all of that, which is revealed in this book, is centered in the Lamb, the cross of Jesus Christ. And we're told that this marriage results in a marriage feast. Feast. Okay? Now, there's been a lot of speculation about that, wonder, wondering about that. Uh, a lot of, lot of different ideas and viewpoints on that. The marriage feast of the Lamb. So we're going to all get together and have a great, I don't know if, if your favorite food's Italian food or tacos or Mexican food or, or I don't know, whatever, the, whatever. Yeah, 
a great, what is it, Golden Corral where you go, you know, there's this fantastic buffet and you can eat. And that's what that is, except it's 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 really probably more Middle Eastern. And it's uh, we're going to be introduced to some new tastes that we've never, things that we've never tasted before. It's just going to be really great. We're going to stuff ourselves like we do kind of do on Thanksgiving. Marriage Feast of the Lamb. That means the lamb is already married, for one. So there will be a feast to celebrate that marriage. And his wife, his wife has made herself ready. And though many say that this wife is the church, I'm, I'm going to suggest it's not the church, but Israel, who in the tribulation period, in the tribulation period, being the wife of Jehovah, she has made herself ready. The marriage of the Lamb is come. That's, that's an heiress tense. Is come, signifying a completed act, showing the marriage has occurred. So it occurs, that marriage occurs sometime, it has to occur sometime between the rapture and the second coming. It, and it also has to follow the judgment seat of Christ, Bema, since the church appears in the righteousness of the saints. So the marriage has to occur between Bema and the second advent. And it must take place in heaven. And, it, and it, mu it only involves Christ in the church. The resurrection of Israel, the Old Testament saints and tribulation saints, those resurrections occur at the second coming. You know, they may be observers, but they cannot be participants. And that's that again, that gets into the time versus eternity issue. But I believe that we're, t we're looking at Israel. Okay? As far as the bride and the wedding feast go, there are those who believe that the Lamb's wife is the church. There are those who believe that it's the church as a unity, not as individuals, but as a unity. There are those who believe that it's the Old Testament saints, and there are those who believe it's all of Israel, and then there are those who believe it's the tribulation saints. There, there are those who believe that it's all of the redeemed, the marriage feast involves Israel. It involves Israel. It takes place on earth. Matthew 22, Matthew 25, Luke 14. What do we know from those chapters? We know that Israel is awaiting the return of the bridegroom and the bride. The feast is a parabolic picture, folks, of the entire millennial age. which Israel and the Gentiles are invited to during the tribulation period, invited how? The gospel of the kingdom, which many will accept and be received in, and many will reject and be cast out. Israel will be waiting for the bridegroom to come from the wedding ceremony, at which time the bridegroom will introduce his bride that the church to his friends, Israel, Matthew 25. We're looking at the parable of the ten virgins. Okay? And I could not count the number of preachers who love the Lord as much as I do and as you do, who divide the church up between wise and foolish virgins, some going so far as to say that this parable is talking about the rapture of the church. It is not. For one thing, the church doesn't make herself ready. We are complete in him by one offering. Those in the tribulation period, same thing. They don't, it's not by, they don't stand in their own righteousness. They're not redeemed because of, of something that they've done. They're redeemed because Christ died in their place. We don't go out of a dispensation of grace into a dispensation of law, as so many believe. No one has ever been saved from beginning to end, okay? 
from the beginning of creation to the end, no one in between there, no one has ever been saved by their own works, by what they do. No one, ever, ever. It's been by grace, from, it's, it is by grace from start to finish, is my point. We are complete in Him by one offering. So are they. He's perfected forever those whom He is setting apart by the blood of His cross. We are presented holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Those of you who struggle with that, I encourage you to, to go through the, the playlist, the videos on our study through Ephesians. There's no making yourself ready. But Israel and the Gentiles in the tribulation period, th this parable of the ten virgins is not talking about, well, oh man, we've got to have oil in our, if we don't have oil in our lamp, we're not going to make the rapture. Folks, that is, um, that is not being honest with the text. And yet that's a popular view today. And so it's, it's basically what that view spawns is it spawns this whole idea, a false idea of, of what we call what's known as a, a partial rapture theory, where that only the good Christians are raptured and, and, and the bad Christians, you know, those who didn't match up, you know, to God's expectations, you know, then they're not going to be raptured and they're going to go through the tribulation period. And, and there's a lot of pride that's based upon that movement, that false movement. This parable of the ten virgins is uh, has nothing to do with the church, okay? Other than the fact that those uh, redeemed who believe in, in Christ, the believing Israel and believing Gentiles who go into the kingdom are friends of the bride of, of Christ, the church, and uh, both will participate in that marriage feast, that banquet feast, whatever you want to call it. I don't believe you can show me a passage of Scripture any place. Uh, you know, one of God's people, anywhere at any time, setting themselves apart for God. You know, if you find it, please let me know, because I've never found it in over 30 years of Bible study. I pray, God, your whole soul, spirit, and body are preserved blameless until the day of our Lord. Faithful is he who called you, who also will do it. Keep your emotions out of that, folks. Just read it. Read what God said, and then decide whether or not you're going to believe what God said. Faithful is he who called you who also will do it. Hebrews chapter 10, by his will are we sanctified. You didn't do it. He did it. So making yourself ready can't be, you know, uh, according to our own works. And then there are those who say, well, yeah, Steve, she's, she has the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, but well, and we've, we have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, but we got to put it on. That's salvation, that's not redemption. If you put on Christ, okay, you as a Christian today, if you, if you put on Christ, it's going to make a difference in your life. But that putting on Christ has to do with deliverance. Deliverance from fear, doubt, law, worry. You know, it has nothing to do with redemption. Only redeemed people can put on Christ. So we're in heaven, we're married to Christ, now He's going to bring us back and we're going to participate in the marriage feast on earth. That's, that's the parabolic picture of the thousand year reign of Christ. And He says unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb the word called is a perfect passive okay so you greeks students know that 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 is saying that they've been called in past time they didn't call themselves they didn't have anything to do with that call they are god's elect and they're blessed they're fortunate 
clothed in fine linen, clothed in fine linen. Five occurrences of that of that word, all in Revelation. And we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. I don't have any problem with the phrase righteousness of the saints because all righteousness is of the Lord. I'm not a child of the sovereign God because I wanted to be, because I decided to be, to be because I woke up one day and I just decided that I was going to, to initiate that miraculous new birth process by something, some will or, uh, you know, of my, of my own, some action, a decision of my own. In the 21st chapter, the wife, the lamb is, is portrayed, uh, as a literal city, as you know, the new Jerusalem that descends out of heaven. That's interesting. And I fell at his feet to worship him, says John. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I'm thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We worship God alone. We don't worship idols. We don't worship angels. We don't worship saints. We don't worship Mary. We don't worship anything but the almighty, sovereign, eternal God. See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. Be careful in your worship not to allow your feelings to overcome you were that you render worship to a creature which is due to God alone, who is alone is worthy. John was so overwhelmed with this tremendous revelation that he was given that he pays undue reverence to the angel who communicated it to him, the messenger. That's messenger. Okay. I'll leave that up to you to decide whether that was one of his brethren, brethren, or uh, an angel, heavenly angel. You are here by his elective decree, by his death in your place, as will all of these individuals be. These are the words of God, the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've got to stop right here. I love you all. I truly do. I hope you all are safe out there. I want to thank you for all of your comments. I read everyone. I'm encouraged, so encouraged by your comments. Follow us on MeWe if you can ever find time to get there. Uh, thank you for all of your love, your prayers. I'm feeling better, less headaches. So I think I'm on my way to recovering. Uh, all praise to God for that. And I thank you so much for your continued prayers for the direction of this ministry. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.